Well, good morning. I'm Bob Hines, one of the pastors here, and I'm glad you could be with us today. Many of you are familiar with the name H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells wrote a book stating that the world is coming to an end. He went on to say that there's no way out, there's no way through this impasse. This is the end of the world as we know it. Now, aren't you glad you came for those encouraging words? Another unknown writer said this, we are on a train gathering speed on an unknown track where there are a number of switches heading to unknown destinations. There are demons at the switches, society is in the caboose, and we're looking backwards. Alexander Stolstenison writes, I wouldn't be surprised to hear of the sudden fall of the West, for the West is on the verge of collapse, created by its own hands. The situation in the world today is not just dangerous, it is catastrophic. Amen. It's catastrophic. Now, there is a strange and contemporary note to these words. Folks, we are continuing in our series, Faith Over Fear. We're working our way through the book of 2 Timothy. Today, we're up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. But know this. Remember, the emphasis in chapter 2 was on being a vessel of honor, being a servant of the Lord. But beginning here in chapter 3, it's understanding the last days and instructions how to, how to respond. You see, many people are like the pilot who went on the, on the intercom. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I have some good news and some bad news. The bad news is we're lost. The good news is we're making great time getting there. <laughs> you know, we have bad news and good news. The end is coming, but the good news is we're making great time getting there, right? We are rapidly approaching that time. The last days began in the ministry of Jesus Christ, and they continue until he returns. They're called the last days because in them, God is completing his purpose for his people. Now, since it's been over 2,000 years, some ignore, some mock, some ridicule. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, it says, Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of, his who come, of him who's coming? You see, as fallen human natures, it is our nature to become impatient when the expectation doesn't instantly come. When there's any type of delay, we, we seem to think, well, it's not true. But he goes on to tell us why he delays down to verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's will that none should perish, but all come to repentance and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You see, as we draw close to Jesus' return, we will face perilous times. That word means dangerous, hard to deal with, savage, Difficult, difficult days. Now, what's interesting is, is the very same Greek word used to describe two violent, demonized men in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. This suggests that the violence in the last days will be energized by demons. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul wrote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Doctrine of demons. You see, some of these characteristics appeared in Paul's day, but they have greatly increased with us today. Now, it's not that we have more people in the world, which, which we do. It's not that we have better news coverage, instant news coverage, which we do. But it, it, it's appearing that evil is deeper and greater in intensity. You see, being, it, being accepted and promoted by society in a bolder way. No longer are we asked to just tolerate and accept sinful, ungodly behavior. Now they're demanding that we fully embrace it. We must come alongside of them and encourage them in their sinfulness. See, it's not just a small pocket of rebellion here and there. All the world seems to be caught up in this rebellion and caught up in wars. Paul gave Timothy three instructions for ministry to be effective during the perilous times. Again, back in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 5, he tells us, having a form of godliness, but denying his power, and from such people turn away. The first instruction we see here is to turn away from the ungodly. 
Turn away from the ungodly. See, a faithful believer should have nothing to do with these people that Paul describes here in the following passages. They, they are religious, but they're rebellious. In verses 2 through 5, we see at least 18 different characteristics listed here. But notice one of the emphasis is love. It talks about there'll be lovers of themselves. They love themselves. There'll be lovers of money. See, people who set their hearts on money are often disappointed when they get it. The desire for money and our stewardship of it can cause just as many problems as the devil himself. People ruin their homes for money. They forfeit their integrity for money. They sacrifice their lives for money. Some worship it. Some beg for it. Some marry for it. Some inherit it. But you know what? The majority of us have to work for it, right? Yep. We all spend it, and we all want more of it. The deceitfulness of the pocketbook promises what it cannot produce. It promises what it cannot produce. He goes on in verse 4, he says, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, folks, understand this is not limited to the desires of comfort, food, and sexual uh, satisfaction that is often associated with hedonism. Don't miss this. The person has great pleasure in the rest of the things that are listed here. This person has great satisfaction from the pain and the misery inflicted in others, including his or her parents and so-called friends. Folks, we need to realize this simple truth. The heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. The heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. Jesus makes that clear in Matthew chapter 27. Remember, Jesus is talking with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they're trying to debate him. And one of the lawyers that says he's trying to test Jesus, he asked him, what is the greatest commandment? To which Jesus responded in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love, the, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. Heart, mind, and soul. He's talking about the whole person, the whole being. And a love for God will naturally lead to a love for others who are made in his image. Folks, that's one of the reasons as Christians we oppose abortion because individual human beings are made in the image of God. And we have to be the voice for the voiceless. Jesus reduces the Ten Commandments down to two. He says, love God and love others. You know, today it's, it's widely claimed by, by psychiatrists that a person cannot love God and love others rightly until he or she loves himself or herself rightly. It's the complete opposite of what Jesus says. Jesus says it starts with loving God. When we love God correctly, then we're going to love others properly as well. Now, I don't know about you, but someone who's raised from the dead and tells me something, I'm going to listen to him. <laughs> you see, we are to love others and because we love God. Now, in this universe that God has created... It's very simple. There, there are three basic things. There's God, there's people, and there's things. And if we follow Jesus Christ, if we say we're followers of Jesus Christ, then what do we do? We should worship God. We should worship God, we should love people, and then we use things. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we worship God, we love people, we use things. Now, if we choose to ignore <clears throat> If we choose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens? We, we end up worshiping ourselves, loving things, and using people. If we reject or ignore the Lord Jesus Christ, we end up worshiping ourselves, loving things, and using people. And this is a formula for a very, very miserable life. And yet it characterizes so many people today. If someone loves and worships himself, the result is going to be pride. In Genesis 3, 5, the serpent's offer to Eve was, you will be like God. You will be like God. And we know the results there was not very favorable. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 24, it says, therefore, God gave them up to their uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Here it is, verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Therefore, God gave them up. This happens only after adequate revelation of his being. 
We look back in verse 20, it says, they are without excuse. Human beings are without excuse. God does not cause anyone's demise. The natural law of consequence does. Well, Paul goes on here. In verse 2, it says, list more character, characteristics. Disobedient to parents. Children are unthankful and do not appreciate what their parents have done for them. Unholy. See, this person is driven by self-love to gratify his lust and passions, whatever. No, no matter, no thought whatsoever to, pro to property or, or decency or personal reputation. None of that matters. Paul says unloving. He cares only for his own welfare. Nothing about anybody else. And, and, and in, the, in the simplest way of stating it, he is asking, what is best for me? What's in it for me? What can I gain? It's all about me. Author Robert Ringer wrote a book on how to win through intimidation. He then wrote a second book, Looking Out for Number One. Now, the question is, did he truly believe what he wrote? When interviewed, he said this, and I quote, I only wrote this book to make as much money as possible. I knew this theme would appeal to most men and women today. And it certainly did. It made the bestsellers live for over a year. He was right. It appealed to many men and women. Look out for number one. Do what you want to others. Make as much money as you can. Robert Ringer has, a, uh, has taken a love for self to a higher level, a, high, a love for money, a love for pleasure. He elevated to a sick nobility. He, he makes it appear if this is the right thing that we should be doing. In one part of his books, he writes this, forget about morality others have tried to cram down your throat. You need to do what's best for you. You need to do what's best for you. Boy, that is a great example of being unloving. He goes on and he talks about unforgiving. Unforgiving. It, it means they're unwilling to forgive others, but they're also unwilling to accept forgiveness toward themselves. Now concerning others, look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. See, in the church, I find many people struggle more with accepting forgiveness than giving it. I, I often hear people say something like, well, Pastor, I just don't feel forgiven. And basically what you're doing is you're calling God a liar. Because if 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us of our own righteousness. So if he says he forgives us, and yet we say, well, I, I don't feel forgiven, what we're basically saying is, God, you're a liar. We, we need to understand, either I'm going to live by my feelings, or I'm going to live by the truth of God's word. You have to make that choice. Unwilling to forgive, unwilling to be forgiven. Now, some refuse to forgive, and or, or, or refuse to accept forgiveness, knowingly destroying their own life and their life of their family. When we refuse to forgive or refuse to accept forgiveness, we can very well destroy our own lives and the life of our family. No compromise, no reconciliation is going to have serious, serious consequences. He goes on and says they're slanderous, without self-control, brutal, Brutal, they're like a wild beast whose nature is to attack and destroy its enemies. Despisers of good, hating what God loves and loves what God hates. Back in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those traitors turning against their friends and family, usually for some sort of personal gain. You know, we look in world history and we see before World War II, when we look into Germany, remember... Luther was from Germany. And yet what happened, here you, you had young children that would turn on their parents. If their parents said anything against Hitler or his regime, then what would happen? They would tell authorities and their parents would be arrested. A perfect example here of what it's talking about, being a traitor. Headstrong. This, this person is so preoccupied with his own interests that he simply does not notice the people and things around him that are not related to his concern. Haughty, ha having, having a much higher view of himself than is justified. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. You see, form here talks about outward appearance. Remember, Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites? 
He said, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Having a form of godliness suggests an outward appearance of religion, but not true Christianity. They have never experienced the tremendous power of Jesus Christ in their lives. Their form without force, their religion without reality. Now, understand, only God knows the heart. But one of the great concerns I have is that people sit here week after week, are they truly born again? Do they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Have they just gone through the motions, or have they truly experienced the power of God's healing in their life? You see, one of the things that is so important that, that is often missed today is true repentance. Remember, to become a Christian means you have to, first of all, recognize you've sinned against God, your word, thoughts, or deeds, you've sinned against it, and then you repent. Biblical repentance is not only asking God to forgive us, but it's turning around, it's going a different direction. I was once living my life doing whatever I wanted to do. When I repent, I start to follow Jesus. I receive him as my Lord and Savior. And, 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 and then what happens, there should be a demonstration of some spiritual fruit. So are we going a different way? Do you know for sure you're truly born again? Well, Paul goes on here in verses 6 and 7. He tells us, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, they use religious language. They profess a belief in a God, but their real love is a person in the mirror. You know, back in Ezekiel, remember Ezekiel was God's appointed watchman. And for Israel, and listen to what it says here, in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 30. As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another. Everyone is saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as, as, my, as people do, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words. Oh, my friends, this is, this is a dream for every preacher. <laughs> People are talking about, no, we got to come here and preach. But, but they do not do them. They do not do them. See, the people like to come and hear the message of God. It tickled their ears, but it never penetrated their heart. The same with people today. You, you hear they love to come and hear good preaching, but it doesn't seem to change anything. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Be doers of the word not, and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Now, what's interesting in this passage in 2 Timothy 3, verses 5 through 9, it indicates that Paul expected these people to appear in the church rather than outside it. So outwardly, they looked like Christians, but inwardly, they were pagans. You know, it's estimated that Christianity will lose 66 million 66 million followers between 2010 and 2050. I believe it. 66 million. I shared this with you last week, and it's so upsetting to me, I, I, I want to share it again. 2022 State of Theology Survey asked this question, are there many ways to God? Are there many ways to God? 56% of Americans who claim to be evangelicals said yes. 56%. Back in 2020, it was 48%. They'll be taking that, that survey again this year. It'll be interesting to see what the results will be. See, they believe that we can gain access to God through all religions. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, you're Jew, you're Muslim, you're Buddhist. It doesn't matter. But folks, we need to understand these religions are contradictory. So how can they teach the same thing? For example, Jesus tells us very clearly in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pretty exclusive. Jesus is the only way. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Remember, we live in a society where tolerance is king, not biblical truth. And we have got to stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, whether they're a man or a woman, people who fall for these false religious systems have the same characteristics. False leaders 
take advantage of the problems people are having, and, and they offer to them quick and easy solutions. Look, at, we are complex human beings. Very rarely is there a quick, easy solution to the problems we've got ourselves into. You know, many of us take 20, 30, 40 years getting in the shape we're in, and then we want instantly fix, right? Rarely does that happen. And what are we supposed to do? He says, and from such people turn away. And I find it interesting in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 24, it says, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You know, today many people give in to the passing pleasures of sin. And I believe it's not because they want too much. I think it's because many people have settled for too little. Jesus tells us very clearly in John 10, 10, I have the thief, Satan himself, has come to steal, kill, and destroy but Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Have the abundant life. And too many people claim to be followers of Jesus Christ and they settle for too little. They settle for the things of the world rather than the abundant life that Jesus offers to us. You see, we must keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ and doing what he has called us to do. So instruction number one, turn away from the ungodly. Instruction number two is found in verse 10. In verse 10, he tells us, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. Second instruction is to follow those who are true. Follow those who are true. But you have carefully followed. It literally means to walk alongside of, follow in their footsteps. Paul's letter is filled with examples of, of godly men and women who helped encourage others to walk alongside of Jesus. How many times have you heard something like this? Well, I'd like to go to church, but it's just full of a bunch of hypocrites. You know, if somebody tells you that, say, hey, we got room for one more. Come on, join us. <laughs> See, so what are the characteristics we should be looking for in believers? Well, first of all, their life is open. Their life is open. When I was in third grade, I was already headed down a bad path. And I had a third grade teacher who was a former missionary with a Baptist organization. Because of health reasons, she had to come back. She'd been a missionary in Africa. And in third grade, I, I didn't know anything about Christianity. I didn't grow up in a church, didn't know anything about this. And I knew there was something different about this lady. She, I don't ever remember her talking about Jesus, but I knew there was something very radically different about her. I mean, I actually even tried to be good in her class. So you know it's a miracle. She, I would even stay after school and help her do things, help clean up. Just, I had such admiration for this woman. Now, after I got out of grade school, it was over 20 years that I'd seen her. Miss Storms was her name. Over 20 years. And one evening, we're at home, and there's a knock at the door. I open it up, and there's Miss Storms. She attended a Baptist church there in town, and they were having a vacation Bible school, which they did it for two weeks, <laughs> every day for two weeks. And she wanted to invite our daughters to go. And I had such love and respect and admiration for my third grade teacher I hadn't seen for many, many years. I said, yes. At that point in my life, I claimed to be an atheist. But again, I had such respect and admiration for her, I let the girls go. And it was after attending one of those uh, VBSs that my oldest daughter, Stephanie, came to me and said, Daddy, who is Jesus? And I had to say, I don't know. I didn't know who he was. You see, that's the type of influence we're supposed to have, a life that's open. This woman made such an impression on me that, that I knew there was something different about her. And that's what God wants us to do, make an impression on other people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Her life was open. We, we also see that their teaching is biblical. Now, one of the reasons we have sermon notes is you can take and you can look in your Bibles is whoever is preaching, whether it's me or anybody else, is it biblical? Is it accurate? Are, are they using the verses in context? Their teaching is biblical. They, they practice what they preach. Their purpose is simply to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what's happening? Is Jesus Christ being exalted and glorified? He goes on to say, long-suffering. Long-suffering is a persistent spirit of a servant of Christ who never gives up and never gives in to the people ungodly pressure. 
In other words, he's talking about dealing with difficult, difficult people. Anybody here deal with difficult people? (laughs) Perseverance. Perseverance is not so much dealing with difficult people, but deals with very difficult circumstances. If you think back just a few years ago, when COVID hit 2020, remember we as a church weren't able to meet. And what they've done, they've done surveys since 2020, 53% of religious leaders have seriously considered leaving the pastoral ministry. 53%. We need to persevere. Don't give up. Don't quit. Just because things are hard, we can't quit. We got to keep going, keep pushing through. Hebrews 10.36 tells us, for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And what is that promise? Well, look here in verse 12. He said, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, isn't that some promise? (laughs) All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All faithful believers should expect opposition from the world. He didn't say we might. He said we will suffer persecution. Now, realize, when opposition becomes severe enough, we will suffer for our faith, just like Paul did, just like Timothy did. He goes on here in verse 13 and 14. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them. Here's the third instruction. We must continue. We must continue in God's word. The only way to defeat Satan's lie is with God's truth. Evil men and deceivers and liars will get worse and worse. Why? Because they're spurred on by Satan himself. Religious charlatans will produce converts in their own image, not in the image of Christ. Folks, this illustration is a true story. I I wished it weren't. A bunch of women gathered at the old country buffet in a Boston shopping mall. They laughed and chatted as they dug into their roast beef and ice cream. They could be any group of young moms and college students enjoying a night out, but they weren't. These women are recent converts into the Islam religion, celebrating the end of Ramadan. They symbolize a curious new phenomenon in the wake of September 11, 2001, a surge of Islamic conversions. Tiffany A University of Massachusetts theater major said, I used to feel something was wrong with me because I didn't grasp the concept of God. Now I finally have peace of heart. You see, when it comes to Islamic conversions, you can't help but consider the ironies. Throughout history, Islam was spread through violent conquest. Today, after Islamic radicals killed thousands of our neighbors, Americans are voluntarily converting. Another irony is around our country, many, many churches are asking very little of its members. Show up for an hour on Sunday morning, throw a few dollars in the offering plate. We we don't want to ask, we don't want to tax you too much. Meanwhile, Islam, which on September 11th suffered a huge public relations debacle, attracts converts through rigid rules of conduct, dress, and life. Islam is now the fastest growing religion in the U.S. What's going on? 9-11 attacks sparked an interest in learning more about Islam, a religion that appears exotic to the Western eyes. During times of crisis, religion with clear definitions of right and wrong looks attractive. Karen, one of the new converts at the old country buffet, told National Post this, Many converts are attracted to Islam's rich mysticism, clear theological rules, its family values and sense of community and moral certainty. Lisa, another diner at the buffet, said, I like the fact to become a Muslim, you don't have to disrespect Jesus. He is still a prophet, just not the son of God. Lisa, don't you realize that placing Muhammad above Jesus is the ultimate form of disrespect? See, American churches need to make sure that we stay true to God's word. We need to stay true to what the scripture says. As Christians, we can offer our friends and neighbors the magnificent truth which no Muslim can claim. John 3.16. Come on, share. I want to share. Let's share it together. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you understand we're the only ones that have that truth? Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. 
See, the only way a believer is able to tell the truth from false is by knowing God's word. Again, going back to 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you have the NIV translation, it says all scripture is God breathed. It means the same thing. The doctrine of inspiration of scripture is vitally, vitally important. You see, Satan has attacked it from the very beginning. Remember back in Genesis 3, 1, Satan said, has God said? Did God really say that? Can you really believe that? God has, has not given his people a book that we cannot trust. God tells us about himself, about his word, about his son. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, it says, a God of truth, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Our God is a God of truth. Again, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit, 1 John 5, 6, says the spirit is truth. The Bible in John 17, 17 says, your word is truth. See, the Holy Spirit used men to write the words in the Bible. And 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us in verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit did not erase the, the natural characteristics of the writers. God in his providence prepared the writers for the task of writing the scriptures, the Bible. Every writer has his own distinct style and vocabulary. Each book of the Bible grew out of a special set of circumstances. In his preparation of men, in his guiding of history, and in his working through the Spirit, God brought about the miracle of the Bible. And we know throughout the ages, men have tried to destroy and eliminate the Bible, but they can't get rid of it because God's word stands true. Biblical inspiration refers to the supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit on Bible writers conveying God's truth. Folks, understand the difference. Revelation means the communicating of truth to man by God. That's revelation, communicating the truth of man to God. Inspiration has to do with the recording of this communication in a way that's dependable. We can trust the word of God. Whenever the Bible, whatever the Bible says about itself or about God or about man, about life, about death, about science, about any other subject, it is true. Now, please hear me. This does not mean that every statement in the Bible is true. Why? Because the Bible records the lies of men and the lies of Satan. But the record itself is true. He says all scripture is profitable. That word profitable means it is productive. It is sufficient. Scripture is profitable for what? For doctrine. Doctrine is referring to what is right. Scripture is profitable for reproof. That means what is not right. Scripture is profitable for correction, how to get right. Scripture is profitable for instruction, how to stay right. You see, a Christian who studies and applies the Bible to his or her life will grow in holiness, avoid many pitfalls in this world. Paul states that anyone, anyone, can become a person of God. How? Well, first, it starts by surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember in John 3, 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. Born again means simply, I recognize I'm a sinner in my words, my thoughts, my deeds, my action, I've sinned against God. I recognize that. And I choose to repent. Again, biblical repentance is simply is, is asking God to forgive us, but it also means turning around and going a different direction. I was once doing what I wanted to do, living my life the way I wanted to. God, I'm going to start following you. That's biblical repentance. And you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Savior, your Master. He's in control of your life from that point on. And then what do we do? We study God's Word. We obey God's Word. We submit to the Holy Spirit living in us. We let God's Word control our life. He says complete there. It means in shape, in fit conditions. He's not talking here about sinless perfect, perfection, but it means that we're in shape. We're able to do what God calls us to do. He says equipped for service. Equipped means that the word of God enables a believer to live the life that God wants him to live, to do the ministry God's called each and every one of us to do. The better we know the word, the better we're able to live and work for God. Listen, times are not going to get any better. But as Christians, we can become better people. 
even, even during the bad times. Back in Galilee in the second century, Christian apologist Justin Martyr said, during his lifetime, it was still common to see farmers using plows made by the carpenter Jesus of Nazareth. Think about that. God Almighty spent earthly life working in a wood shop, making tables and chairs and yokes and plows and whatever else they needed. And by that act alone, God established the significance of our work and our service in this world. Theologian Oz Guinness reminds us how intriguing to think about Jesus' plow rather than his cross. Think about Jesus' plow rather than his cross. To wonder what it was that made his plows and yokes last and stand out. Clearly, they must have been very well made if they were still in use in the second century. He goes on to say, a calling is something we do as a response to God's summons and service. Practical discipleship is simply doing what we're supposed to do and doing it for the Lord. You know, Rebecca shared earlier our mission statement. We're everyday people, people like me and you, everyday people living out our God-given calling. Folks, every one of us has a call from God. We're, we're made with a unique purpose for God. Everyday people living out our God-given calling as we invest in others to do the same. Folks, we live in perilous times. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That persecution could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual, but we are going to suffer persecution. And my question for you this morning is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you investing in others that they can stand strong regardless of what comes?